welcome you all to uh, this session. Thank you very much for, for joining us. My name's Tim Mester and I work for the KTN. Um, I lead on the GCRF Agri-Food Africa programme together with my colleagues. And it's my pleasure to, to welcome you to what is, uh, I guess, week five of the virtual missions that we've been running over the last few months. So we're delighted that you can join us for the session. I think you're gonna find it very useful um, to you. What we're looking at today uh, is uh, ODA and how that has an impact on um, the applications for the Agritech Catalyst in particular. And really this is at the heart of, of this program. Um, if, you know, if you look at the mission statement of what we're trying to achieve, ODA compliance and uh, the ODA requirements are really at the heart of that. So this is an important session and, and great one that we can put together and you can join us and listen to some great presentations and we'll have a chance at the end to ask questions. So let me just run through a couple of housekeeping points for you. So we'll, we'll ask everyone to stay muted for this session, uh, which is being recorded. Um, you will be able to have a look at this uh, on YouTube at a later point. So you, if, you, if you do miss any of this, you can come back and, and rewatch it. On our YouTube channel, there's a range of content there from previous weeks. So I do recommend checking that out. If you go onto YouTube and type in GCRF Agri-Food Africa, you'll find the channel and there's a lot of content on there. If you're, we're gonna take some questions at the end. So the best way to do that is by using the Q&A box that you'll have available pop your questions in there. If you wouldn't mind saying your name and where you're from, that helps us just sort of direct the, the question. The other point to make as well is if you do want to tweet about this, you can do that. We've got a hashtag, which is GCRF Agri-Food Africa. So feel free to use that and that will um, give you what you need. So, the, the day today, we're going to be looking at ODA for this first morning session, and then we've got a panel-based session um, on manufacturing in the supply chain at 11 o'clock UK time. And that's for an hour. We'll have, we've got some experts coming in. We're going to ask them a set of questions and have a discussion. Then we'll go into breakout rooms and ask for your input as well. And then we've got a follow-on one on digital and data. So if you are coming to those, um, those are the timings. And then we're going to follow, end up the day with a networking event via Meeting Mojo. So I recommend attending that because I know we get a lot of requests for people asking to connect and it's the best way to do it really. So let's just go through the, the day today um, and who we've got speaking with us. So, so like I said, I'm Tim Messeter from the, the KTN. First person presenting today will be Catherine Miller who works at Innovate UK. Uh, she's going to present on the competition, the Agritech Catalyst Round 10, and how this fits in with ODA requirements. Then we've got Tristan Eagling, who's going to be presenting from his viewpoint, uh, from Difford's viewpoint. Uh, he's normally based in Kenya, and he's going to be looking at why this is such an important topic for the agri-food industry. And then we're going to follow, lastly, we'll have Ed, who is presenting. He's given us, uh, he, he's applied through the catalyst before and has been successful. And so he's gonna give us his insight from his experience of what ODA means for projects. And then at the end, we'll have a question and answer session. So let me um, start the, the presentation with Catherine Miller. And if you do have questions, like I said, put them into the Q&A session, the uh, Q&A box, and we can do that that way. So over to, to yourself, Catherine. Thanks Tim and good morning everyone and uh, welcome to this session on official development assistance or ODA. Um, I'm going to um, just briefly give an overview of ODA, um, explain the question in the Agritech Catalyst application form and then just cover a few examples. So the principle of ODA is that these funds must benefit challenges faced by developing countries and um, Official Development Assistance, or ODA, is defined as flows to countries and territories on the DAC list of ODA recipients. And only research primarily relevant to problems of developing countries can be counted as ODA. So this can include um, research into various things, including as examples, um, tropical pest diseases, livestock, 
um, and crops for developing country conditions. And important for the Agritech Catalyst is that costs can still be counted as ODA if the research is carried out in a developed country. So research can be undertaken in the UK, for example, as long as the benefits are in the developing country you're working with. Next slide, please, Tim. Thank you. So ODA eligibility, as um, Tim mentioned, is a key um, component of the assessment process for the Agritech Catalyst. So in your application, you must clearly just demonstrate how that your project um, will benefit agriculture and food systems in Africa and how you're going to deliver that benefit. Um, during the lifetime of the project, particularly for early stage feasibility projects, it, you may not be able to impact large numbers of people, but in your proposal, you must show um, how you will build a pathway for future development impact. Um, as I mentioned, there can be benefits to the UK, um, so to businesses and to research organisations, but it has to be secondary in nature. And activities in your project must be clearly um, for the challenges in Africa and not for the UK market. So just as a very brief overview for the Agritech Catalyst Round 10 application, um, the application process includes a project detail section, which isn't scored. So this includes a project summary where you need to highlight the challenge, approach and innovation that your project is trying to um, address. And this is really setting the scene for assessors. So you need to explain in, in that section how your project is actually ODA eligible as well, um, but very briefly. Um, you need to include a public description, which um, will be published online if you are successful, and explain the scope. Again, how does your project fit within the scope? So that's within the scope of the um, competition in terms of agriculture and food systems and within um, the ODA scope as well. Um, there's also then um, a couple of questions on um, equality, diversity and inclusion and the consortium setup. But then you'll go through to the next 11 questions. Next slide, please, Tim. So these are the main 11 questions and there is full guidance um, on the innovation funding service for each of these questions. But I'm just going to go into question six, which is the question on official development assistance, just to give you a bit of information about what you'll be asked. Next slide, please. Thank you. So this is the question on ODA. Um, essentially, why is your project eligible for ODA assistance, ODA funding? So you need to explain how your project's main objective will be to promote economic development and welfare of people in developing countries. Um, and again, you can still describe the benefits to the UK. So if you're a UK business, for example, you can describe the benefits to your business, but they need to be secondary. Um, you need to describe um, the benefits to project partners and to people outside the consortium as well. Um, so you need to make a distinction between the two. So how are the partners benefiting, but how are the local communities benefiting as well? And we need to describe any expected socioeconomic impacts, whether they're positive or negative, just to show that you know, you've thought about the impacts that you're having. Um, for example, quality of life, social inclusion or exclusion, um, jobs, whether that's new jobs, displacing jobs, changing people's jobs, um, education, um, health and safety, diversity, there's a, there's a range of different impacts that um, you might have through your project. And um, you need to explain how the project has the potential to deliver impacts um, in agriculture and food systems in Africa, particularly looking at um, how, you, how it will benefit the poorest members of society, including women, girls and other disadvantaged groups, and really explain what the benefits are and who will benefit from them. And you need to be clear about um, how you'll make sure there's a clear route to impact after the project has ended. Next slide, please, Tim. So you can also upload a, um, an appendix to this question to show um, further information about how your project is eligible. And we're also asking for a basic logic model to be uploaded as well. And the aim of this logic model really is to just show the relationship between the activities that you're carrying out in your project and the intended benefits and impacts that um, you are hoping to have in country. So this logic model template um, is um, available once you have um, started your application, you can then download this template. Um, you can use a, a different template, but this is really sort of what we're looking for. It's quite a basic logic model. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so um, I'm going to give three examples of projects um, very brief information about the project um, and ask you to consider whether you think the project is eligible for ODA, system, ODA funding or not. Um, so this is the first example. Um, this is an early stage feasibility study led by a UK university. Other partners in the consortium include an African-based micro SME and an African-based NGO. The funding requested was £200,000. 150,000 to be spent by the African partners and 50,000 by the UK partners. Um, as a summary, the, the project um, is a feasibility project on the domestication, commercial breeding and economic production of a species of large African rodent, recognised as an important rural protein source and popular um, urban premium meat species. And the goal of the project um, was to reduce poverty, um, stimulate the agricultural livestock sector in Ghana. And the aims, just four aims listed there, really to establish a production breeding programme and develop a network of farmers trained in rodent production and processing, deliver small, small business management training and support rodent co cooperatives in northwest Ghana. So, Tim, if you can put the poll up, we're going to ask um, whether you consider it to be eligible or not. Thank you. So from this information, um, do you think this project would be eligible for ODA funding? So um, yes, no, or not sure. Let's give you 30 seconds to fill that in. Tim, can you see how many people have filled it in? Yes, I can. We're at 72% okay. uh, of people. Okay, great. Thanks. Or I can give it another 15 seconds, Catherine, and then we'll have a hit a minute. Perfect. So you, okay, you have, thanks everyone. Can you see the results, Catherine? Yes, I can. So 75% um, thought yes, 8% um, no, 18% not sure. So um, if you just go to the next slide, please, Tim. So this um, project was considered eligible for ODA funding. So the project was led by UK un University, but the benefits to the developing country um, were clear. Um, the goal of the project fits within ODA. Um, in terms of reducing poverty and stimulating the agricultural livestock sector in Ghana. Um, the UK University is likely to benefit from the project still um, with the expansion and gaining of knowledge throughout the project. Um, however, the main focus um, and impact in the, of the project um, was in Ghana. So this was considered eligible. So next slide, please. So this next example, um, again, it's an early stage feasibility study um, led by a UK based SME. Um, the other partners in the consortium include an African based SME, a UK university and an African university. Um, the total funding requested was £400,000, £70,000 to be spent in Africa, £330,000 to be spent in the UK. And the main um, aim of the, of the project is to address food security and primary crop production challenges in Africa, um, to create jobs that would support rural farmers while empowering um, participation of female, female farmers in, agri in the agricultural sector through greenhouse farming. Um, the proposed greenhouse technology for um, Africa is simple to operate and would allow farming to be done in a safe and controlled environment. Um, it also includes simple technology that could be um, produced in country and um, manufactured locally and would be low cost. So the project will include um, development of a greenhouse and associated technologies within um, the African eligible country and also the design and construction of a greenhouse to suit UK conditions here in the UK. So if you just pop the poll up again please Tim and then um, we'll give you another 30 seconds or so to, um, to vote on this one.
Okay, 10 more seconds for those that want to vote. Three, two, one, and we're closed. Okay, thank you everyone. So um, for that um, question, the majority of people thought no, it wouldn't be eligible for ODA funding. Um, next slide, please, Tim. So that is indeed correct. Um, so this project was not considered eligible for ODA funding um, when looking at the whole application. Um, the project proposes to build new infrastructure in the UK, um, but given the prototype will be different in the UK to meet the UK's climatic conditions compared to the infrastructure being built in Africa for African conditions, um, it appears there were definite um, sort of primary benefits here in the UK. Therefore, it was um, seen as not being um, eligible for ODA funding. Um, there is also a relatively small amount of funding going to the African partners, but this doesn't make the project ineligible in itself. Um, however, the activities in the UK must clearly be for challenges in the African market and not for the UK market, which this project um, seems to be focusing on. Thank you. And then we have one more example, um, just a slightly different project. Um, so this is a mid-stage industrial research project um, led by a UK multinational chocolate company. The other partners included a UK university and an African research and technology organisation. The funding requested was £650,000 in total. £100,000 was going to the African partner and £550,000 to the UK organisations. So in West Africa, where 70% of the cocoa is imported and consumed in, in the UK is produced, um, the chocolate industry have identified um, cacao swirl and shoot, shoot disease virus, CSSV, as the major constraint to productivity. Um, so if there is a farm um, with CSSV, um, it will suffer declining yields and hence declining income. Um, so to, delimit, to limit the spread of this disease, a diagnostic test is needed that can detect trees that are infected early on um, before there are any visible signs of the disease. Uh, this can then um, facilitate um, prompt control of CSSV in growing regions um, and allow testing of nursery material to ensure that only disease-free um, plants are planted. So the project um, was aiming to develop and optimise a um, field-based, um, inexpensive and rapid um, test for CSSV um, in a format that could be used within the field. And this will have a significant impact on the economic prospects of um, cocoa farmers in West Africa. So again, if you could just put the poll up for this one, please, Tim, and we'll give you time to pull that in. Okay, I'll give you 10 more seconds. Three, two, one. Okay, thanks, Tim. So the results of this one, again, the majority um, think that this um, project um, was eligible for ODA funding, probably slightly less um, people were sure about this one than the first one. Um, but this project um, was considered for ODA funding. Um, it was considered eligible. eligible. Um, a large proportion of funding is going to UK partners. Um, however, as I mentioned before, this, this doesn't um, mean that the project isn't ODA eligible. Um, if the primary objective of the project is to deliver impact in the target developing country, which it's felt that this project um, was, was aiming to do that. Um, so although the project is led by a UK company, the benefits of the developing country um, were very clear. 
and the UK company is, is still likely to benefit from the project with a more resilient and sustainable supply chain. Um, but there, there are also potential benefits for the UK company producing the um, diagnostic test to be able to market that new test. The UK university is likely to benefit from the project with the expansion of, of and gaining of knowledge throughout the project. However, the main, the main focus of the project and impact um, is within the cocoa producing regions of Africa. Okay, next slide please, Tim. Okay, I hope the examples give you a bit of an idea of what to consider in terms of whether your project is ODA eligible. Um, it's not um, a simple sort of black and white decision necessarily, it's more around um, making sure that um, your project's main aims are within the developing country that you're working with. So as part of your application, um, you must explain how the project's main objective will promote economic development and welfare of people in developing countries. UK and UK partner benefits um, can still occur, but they need to be secondary. Um, ODA eligibility is key part of the assessment process, and we do have assessors for this competition from a pool of, of people with backgrounds um, from academia and industry, but also with international development and ODX, ODA expertise as well. Next slide, please. So if you have any questions, um, please um, drop us a line. There's an email address, support at innovateukukri.org, um, and there's a phone number as well. You can also um, speak to the KTN, and our Innovate website is on there as well for further information. Thank you very much, and um, if you have any questions, then I'm happy to answer them at the end of the presentations. Thanks. That was great. Thank you very much, Catherine, for that. Um, I really loved the poll. I think that's really useful for us to uh, have a think about ODA and how we can put that, make sure that those are in the proposals that we're submitting. So next uh, speaker we have uh, is Tristan Eagling, who's, like I mentioned, normally based in Kenya. Um, he works for DFID there as a technology and innovation advisor for, for East Africa. This is a, a pre-recorded presentation that he's prepared. Um, and we'll, we'll go over to him and then we'll have to take questions at the end. So if you do have any questions for Catherine or for Tristan or for our next speaker, Ed, then please put those in the question and answer box. Thank you. So over to Tristan. Hi, good morning. Um, hopefully you can all hear me. Um, so yeah, um, my name is Tristan Eaglin and I'm a science, technology and innovation advisor for DFID. Um, so today I've been asked to talk about you know, the importance of food systems and a little bit more around sort of ODA and R&D. Um, just as some background, you know, I work for our science, technology and innovation team and we look more broadly across all different technologies um, within the regions we work. So I work for in East Africa and I've got counterparts in West Africa and Southern Africa. Um, I mean, I'm actually very interested in this particular topic though, um, because before working for DFID, I was actually in KTN's agri-food team and my sort of academic background is in nutrition. So it's something I find really interesting. Um, so the talk's gonna be split into three parts. So first I'm gonna touch on a little bit more about ODA and R&D. Um, then talk about the importance of food systems for the sort of donor environment and odour. And then finally, just touch on some of our preliminary data we've had on the effects of COVID-19 on food systems. Um, so just to start, um, you know, the UK is the major funder of odour R&D research in the world. So we fund more than any other country and more than the next 15 countries combined. Um, you know, a consequence of this is it can some kind, sometimes be quite disparate. Um, so we have a lot of individual funders um, and you know, an increasingly large amount going into this area. So part of my role is to try and create some coherence around that within my region, so within East Africa. So a significant part of that funding tends to be grant funding. Um, and for those of us who work with sort of grant funding and in research innovation ecosystems, um, you know, it's quite dark art. So we refer to it as a portfolio approach. But what we mean is we, you know, we throw mud at a wall and we hope some of it sticks. We never really fully understand when an innovation is going to scale or when a research output is going to have genuine impact. Um, so something my team does is we try and make the walls stick here. Um, so when mud is thrown at it, more of it sticks. Um, and we do that through three programs. 
Um, so the first one is the Science Grants and Council Initiative, um, and this looks to provide some match funding and build capacity for other you know, research councils effectively in other African countries. Uh, we also have a programme called Strengthening Research Institutions in Africa, um, which again looks more at the sort of academic research ecosystem, and then a corresponding and related programme called the Africa Technology and Innovation Partnerships, or ATIP, um, and this looks to improve innovation ecosystems, so that more innovations and technology developed in Africa come to scale um, and that's going to look at a variety of things like the sort of finance environment um, IP regulations and sort of policy environment so one of the things I was asked to do was link food systems to the SDGs um, so obviously food systems are linked to SDG 2 around zero hunger if we think more holistically than that food systems are always linked to um, no poverty and good health. So this is when we consider the number of people employed by the agri-food sector, the link to no poverty. And then when we think about the effects of undernutrition and overnutrition, the effects on good health and well-being. However, there's some research done recently which showed if we fail to meet um, SDG 2, there's going to be a knock-on effect to 11 other SDGs. Um, so this can affect things as diverse as quality education. So if you think productivity on farms are lower, that means more children are being made to work on those farms. They've got less time for education. Um, things like nitrogen runoff are affecting life below water. And then there's the obvious link between climate emissions, uh, so carbon emissions and climate action. So why is agri-food a target for odour spending? Um, just to give it some context, after global health, global security is the most well funded area of voter research. So if you look at the portfolio, for example, of Bill and Melinda Gates, um, they almost exclusively fund global health and food security. Um, so it might not feel like that sometimes, but food security and this sort of agri-food area does receive you know, substantial amounts of funding relative to other sectors. Um, you know, DFID looks at agri-food through three different lenses of what we're trying to achieve. Um, so the first one is economic growth and poverty reduction. Um, the second one is food security and improved nutrition. And the third one is sustainable food systems, which has become sort of more and more about climate smart agriculture and reducing cl climate emissions from the food system. Uh, so let's go into a little bit more detail around the economics of food systems and how DFID sees it. Um, yeah, agriculture is a key opportunity for economic growth. In low-income gro countries, growth originating in agriculture is more poverty reducing than growth originating from any other sector. Um, recent research finds that applies until econom economies exceed $3,000 per capita. So that's most of the countries we work in. Um, it's really obvious that you know, where we should be looking is that agricultural section. If we can make that more productive, we can have massive knock-on effects to the rest of the economy. Um, you know, Another topic which is becoming more and more important is food systems as a source of jobs. So if you speak to any African governments, they'll tell you the biggest concern is jobs. You know, they've got population growth, but the job market isn't increasing at the same speed. Um, the food system is a massive employer of jobs, um, creator of jobs even. So, it, you know, there's primary production, but then obviously there's midstream and downstream. And what's really exciting with agri-tech is increasingly we're starting to see a creation of high-skilled jobs within the agri-food sector. Um, so just some examples around sort of digitalization of supply chains, drone pilots, um, food scientists in product development, for example. I mean, the big one ever when we talk about food security though is global malnutrition. So all of this data is taken from FAO's 2020 report on where we are with food security. Um, some sort of interesting trends is, you know, when we talk about chronic hunger, up until about 2015, chronic hunger was on the way down. Um, so we we're making loads and loads of progress. Um, since then, we've actually seen a reverse of that. So chronic hunger is on its way up, currently affects 690 million people, and that went up 10 million since 2018. So that's not a big gap, but it's definitely movement within the wrong direction. Um, but outside of chronic hunger, which is a sort of calorie deficit, um, we've actually got 2 million people don't have regular access to safe and nutritious food. Um, so there's elements of food safety, but yeah, um, how nutritionally dense is that food? And then even when people do have access to it, 3 million people can't afford healthy diets. So we know that things like meat and fruit and vegetable are much more expensive than rice, and this makes people make unhealthy food choices. 
Um, and then there's knock-on effects of malnutrition. So lower, predict, lower productivity is related to malnutrition, and in Africa, that's assumed to reduce Africa's GDP by up to 11%. Um, there's decreased learning outcomes, like especially when we look at micronutrients such as zinc or iron. You know, being malnutrition, mal being malnourished in childhood has mass effects on learning outcomes throughout life. Um, and something which is really relevant right now is that increased susceptibility to infectious diseases. So again, things like zinc malnutrition really reduce the immune system. And you know, increased risk of obesity in later life for malnourished as a child. And obesity and overnutrition have become a bigger and bigger problem not just in the sort of high income countries. And then, yeah, there's numerous diet related chronic diseases which put a burden on our health system. So, yeah, I just want to touch on you know, how food systems interact with climate. Um, so, there's a duality around food systems when we talk about climate. So, on one hand, food systems are vulnerable to climate, um, and estimates suggest up to 122 million more people worldwide may live in extreme poverty as soon as 2030 as a result of climate change impacts and incomes on small scale farmers. Um, but obviously, Probably equally as concerning, if not more concerning, is the fact that food systems are actually a major contributor to climate change. Um, so current estimates put it at producing 19 to 29% of carbon emissions. Um, it's very controversial on how you choose to measure that, but whichever, you know, whichever metrics you use, it's a significant proportion of global carbon emissions. Um, you know, research has shown that actually switching to more sustainable diets could reduce this figure to as low as 70% by 2050. Um, however, sort of more pessimistically, if we continue to current trends, we can see food systems contributing to 51 percent of global carbon emissions um, so as you can see we're at a real crossroads right now and you know, what we do and how we build future systems in the midterm are going to have a major effect on our climate in the long term so finally i just want to touch on a topic which is probably all on our minds um, you know how covid19 has affected these food systems so there's some positives um, not many but i've found them um, so the first positive, we've seen an acceleration in digital transformation of supply chains and uses of mobile money. So this was happening already, but in some of the markets we've seen, this has really accelerated. And that has had positive effects on you know, reducing or increasing the value of some smallholder farmers to get their crops, um, you know, accessing markets and things like that. Um, in Liberia and Malawi, we haven't seen negative impact on food security for lowest income households. So this is largely because they don't have much off-farm incomes, haven't been that affected by what's sort of going on outside of you know, their village or where they're working. Um, but we did look, we did do quite a detailed study on 500 farmers in Kenya. Um, and what we've seen is financial, system, you know, financial situation has worsened within 87% of those. Um, they started to adopt coping mechanisms, so getting loans or changing their crops. Um, and over half have had to take significant steps like selling assets. Um, on the right hand side, you can see there, um, it's just a sort of breakdown of some of the activity people have had to do. So they tend to be higher and less. Um, that's often due to restrictions on traveling and reduced income, um, which means they're working more. Um, and this as a family as well. So this tends to have implications for education and things like that. Um, we've seen supply chain disruption. Um, so in East Africa, for example, trucks are being kept at borders for sometimes 24, 48 hours. Um, and the crops, which this has the biggest knock-on effect for, are obviously fruit and vegetables. And fruit and vegetables are those sort of nutrition-dense crops. Um, so what we're seeing is you know, this potential supply chain disruption may have start to have an effect on healthy and nutritious diet. And then finally, we've seen a rise in food prices, and this is disproportionately affecting low-income countries. Oh, so that's great. That's yeah. I just want to wrap up there. Um, like I said before, like I'm not in our agricultural team, so if you are interested in sort of different approach to agriculture, I would recommend speaking to Duncan Barker in the first instance, who some of you might know. He's been involved in the Agritech Catalyst since the beginning. Um, if you're interested more in innovation ecosystems within East Africa, or you're looking for partnerships within East Africa, um, then please do contact myself. And you know, if you're looking for that same sort of service within West Africa. Um, you can speak to my colleague Leanne Jones, and then in Southern Africa, um, Kristen Close. Um, brilliant, thank you. Well.
That's excellent. Thank you very much for that, Tristan. Uh, very useful uh, insights there for us. We're now going to hear from Ed Morrison, uh, who's going to be telling us a little bit about their project and how that had to fit in with ODA and how they, they address some of those challenges. This is a pre-recorded talk as well, so we'll, we'll listen to that and then we'll take questions at the end. So if you've got any questions for our speakers, do put them in the the, the um, chat box, the, sorry, the question and answer box, and then we'll, we'll get those at the end. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Ed Morrison. I'm an ecologist working here in Kenya. Um, let me start by saying thank you to the organizers for this morning and to Difford and uh, Innovate UK for continuing to support our projects. Um, I'm part of a consortium of businesses and research institutes working and delivering uh, Innovate UK projects between the UK and Kenya. So I wanted to share with you some experiences of that and particularly focus on the ODA requirements of Agritech. The projects that I'm referring to, one was called Bean Wilt, and that's finished, actually. It was under a round five grant um, that focused on improving consistency of yields and quality of large and small scale bean production in Kenya using precision management tools. Now, from that, the same consortium applied to round seven and was awarded a grant for the project Bean Flower, which is the, the current ongoing project. Uh, which sought to what well, seeks to develop strategies to alleviate heat stress induced flower abortion and to prevent yield losses therefore in both fine and runner beans again at two two scales um, large commercial farmers and smallholder farmers here in Kenya the consortium is made up of five partners VP group or vegpro um, is a large producer of vegetables and roses in Kenya, uh, indeed in Africa. Um, they have a large land base of 3,000 hectares and some 10,000 employees. And cri critically for this project, they also have 5,000 or more smallholder outgrows as part of their supply chain, which is important for our ODA requirements, as we'll see. We've partnered with DuduTech, who are a leading IPM company here in Kenya. They research and produce biological control agents. If you're in the UK, no doubt you've heard of MAYAB EMR, very large research institute conducting strategic and applied research in horticulture. We have WeatherQuest, who are an SME, delivering weather and climate services, again with a focus on agriculture. And the project lead is Providence Partners, who are based in London and are a major supplier of fresh produce from both British and international growers into UK supermarkets. So that's the consortium. This is the nature of our uh, work. Um, the fresh vegetable industry is indeed a vital part of Kenya's economy, with over 60,000 tonnes of fine and runner beans alone being exported from Kenya, with the UK receiving around half of that volume, about £180 million a year in value. Uh, horticultural exports make up about one-fifth of Kenya's GDP, with the industry employing about four and a half million people and indirectly supporting a further three and a half million. However, the IPCC reports that yields of major crops in Africa are predicted to decline by 10 to 20 percent uh, over the next 30 years or so. So the aim of our research then is to improve fine and runner bean plant resilience to combined heat and drought stress. This is particularly important because the area suited for bean crops in Eastern and Central Africa could shrink by up to 50% over that same time frame. So how do we propose to do this? Well, we are investigating and applying improved plant management techniques, including irrigation scheduling strategies. Uh, we're stress priming young plants and we're employing these biological control agents we mentioned. So from this, we expect to deliver a 20% increase in average yield and a 40% reduction in waste, which would raise marketable volumes by um, about 2,500 tonnes a year and generate additional income of some £6.6 .6 million. Pounds. So the outputs are intended to therefore increase food and job security, 
uh, enhance crop production and management skills, accelerate sustainable intensification of large and small scale bean production, and increase resilience to climate change in Kenya, as well as other countries where um, improved precision is needed to deliver these economic, environmental, and social impacts. Let's focus on uh, our approach to ODA requirements, specifically to our projects, of course, but hopefully you can draw something from these. Um, we hopefully demonstrated uh, in our application how our proposed research is relevant to the challenges that face developing countries and specifically tackling the following objectives, strengthening resilience and response to crises, promoting global prosperity and tackling extreme poverty and helping the world's most vulnerable. That was in addition to the following GCRF challenges, namely secure and resilient food systems supported by sustainable agriculture and resilience and action on short-term environmental shocks and long-term environmental changes. Now, so, you must give detail on, on multiple um, areas of impact as regards the ODA requirements. Um, and I'm just going to talk to a few that we considered. Um, one area was obviously to the consortium members themselves, that's the applicants. We outlined um, how the commercialization of our outputs would extend the market position for industry partners, how the results of research will improve security and sustainability of supply chains, uh, or perhaps increase marketable yields and, and reduce waste to enhance export volumes. Now here you, you must give numbers and you must quantify these outputs. Um, you might consider how new markets will create novel business opportunities such that the application demonstrates a strong return on the investment from this public funding. Um, as regards the rural poor, our consortium started by making field visits to outgrowers who are the intended beneficiaries of our project and from these we highlighted opportunities to improve consistency of yields and reinforce the notion of preconditioning treatments um, irrigation scheduling tools and the use of transplants um, of seedlings instead of directly sown seeds so again when you talk to these quantify the benefits whether that's in terms of food security or worker welfare social harmony etc Agriculture and food systems more, more widely, we, we touched on the establishment of these better plant management techniques, obviously, the development of guidelines on how best to evaluate plant performance in field-based production systems, and how um, informing research work in, in other horticultural sectors, um, which also need to accelerate sustainable intensification. So there's some um, talk of additionality there. And environmental impacts, of course. So I remember we calculated waste streams and their embedded water volumes. So demonstrating improvements in operational water footprints, showing how improvements in product quality to limit uh, rejects helps to manage carbon emissions and demonstrating greater resource efficiency for improved environmental um, management. Now you have an appendix in the application and it's strongly um, recommended that you make use of it to demonstrate evidence uh, in, in further areas of impact for your ODA requirements. Um, I will just change the slides so that we can have something to look at as we, as we talk through these. So as regards social impacts, we outlined how higher annual incomes would benefit the rural poor. Um, uh, the reduction of malnutrition among under fives, health benefits of the working population translating into increased productivity levels and reduced health-related absenteeism. Also the benefits of new knowledge and practical ways to optimize crop rotations, reduce reliance on pesticides, etc. The key message here is meaningful engagement with intended beneficiaries from the outset. So you really have to listen and not just assume that we know what's needed or, or wanted at that level. Um, I should mention um, in the bottom left photo where it says DDT, that is not the nefarious um, uh, pesticide. 
um, or, of yesteryear that is in fact a drying down treatment. Um, in the photo to the top left you see the nutrition garden which acts as a, a demonstration site and a sort of living classroom where the discussions uh, with outgrowers and other farmers uh, are held um, for um, to guide uh, our, uh, our project development and that's a very useful tool for um, understanding what the needs and wants are at a local level. In terms of wider industry, uh, we, we consider how the likelihood of significant weather events, as we discussed at the beginning, will encourage broader uptake of technologies um, as other growers strive to offset predicted yield losses over the next few decades, as well as the utility of forecasting models that we're developing and ground truth data from our project. Again, some additionality to your application. In terms of food security, we considered how improved productivity and consistency in yields will generate higher and more stable revenues with positive impacts on workers' health through enhanced nutrition, um, access to appropriate food and education, providing for job security. Again, quantify these um, points, uh, perhaps consider you know, cost-benefit analysis. Um, and we further use the appendix to expand on the gender equality section, which is a separate uh, component in the application, and how this will be achieved, um, in our case, through outreach activities coordinated by local advisors um, and the need to learn of current challenges and issues um, in the project area and consider how these will be addressed, monitored and managed uh, throughout your project. So end on some lessons learned. Uh, the consortium itself is, is critical that you choose the right partners. There must be demonstrable and complementary expertise uh, among the consortium. Everyone should have value to add. Um, I can share with you that our first application wasn't successful. Um, one of the major partners was uh, deemed to have been, should have been funding the project themselves and it wasn't worthy of uh, public funding. So don't be put off if you get negative feedback to begin with, if it's all useful. Um, ensure careful allocation of resources across the partners. Uh, this is particularly key when you have um, uh, collaborations obviously between the UK and the overseas sites where people might not be so familiar with the, the needs and conditions of um, of the in-country situations um, and moving on from that the local um, context has to be properly understood uh, these local challenges um, need to be appreciated by the consortium and for the application to um, to be successful um, and again focus on the, uh, the challenges which are relevant to the ADA uh, requirements uh, really listen to your intended beneficiaries and make sure you're tailing them tailoring the application to those needs. But don't forget the science <laughs> uh, under um, underwriting decision-making, um, get to the heart of, of how you can help tackle these major challenges faced by commercial and small-scale growers. Um, the proposal itself, I'll let you read through them, but uh, don't make mistakes by um, missing out uh, critical information uh, make sure you articulate the risks that your um, of your proposed solution or technology, uh, and and don't leave it until uh, the early as early hours of the morning to uh, to um, make your contribution or even submit the bid, because you won't be making many friends among the consortium if you do. Um, and exploitation and outputs, be very clear uh, what the outputs are intended. Um, and how they will impact on your uh, beneficiaries. From that, develop a very strong exploitation plan, in our case involving a lot of outreach to the smallholder farmers. Um, we consider that audience and the, and the application of the solutions at their scale of production. And finally, articulate what successful project outcomes look like for these different target groups. That's to say, remember the ODA requirements pay attention to them and use the appendix if you can. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I think I will um, see you in the Q&A session. Excellent. Thank you very much um, for that, Ed. That was a really interesting project. Um, delighted to hear how that was going. Just a, we have a few questions that have come in, so we'll, we'll tackle those. And if you do have some 
Uh, we've got about nine minutes or so to take some questions. So first, I think for Catherine, uh, there's a question here from Mark Berry asking, do you need to have an SME as part of your consortium to be eligible? Thanks, Tim. Um, no, you don't have to have an SME. Um, you need to have um, a business as a minimum. You need to have um, one business involved in your consortium for um, early and mid-stage projects. For late-stage projects, you need to have a minimum of two businesses, but they can be of any size. That's great. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, and I'll stick with you for the next one from Colin McKenzie. Uh, he's asked a long question, uh, which effectively boils down to um, the, the cuts to, to the budget and if this is going to impact on this programme. Would you be able care to go to that? And then I'll, I'll come to Tristan. Yeah, that's fine. Thanks, Tim. Um, and thanks for the question. Um, so, yes, um, there have been some cuts um, in ODA, um, specifically around um, GDP falling um, in relation to COVID-19. Um, and we have been in discussion um, with Bayes um, around budgets for this programme. Um, but no, we're not planning on making any cuts. Um, this is a five year programme and we're in um, the second year and we, we do have some flexibility around um, the the funding across the programme, um, but also for the Agritech Catalyst, we've also had um, DFID have been funding this as well since the beginning. Um, so through the sort of more recent rounds, we've been able to, um, as I said, be flexible. Um, I guess prior to the um, cuts, um, we may have increased the budget for this round um, because you know, projects that maybe haven't started or have failed um, in previous rounds, we can potentially look at redeploying that budget into this round. We haven't done that. So whilst we're not making cuts, um, we, we've not been able to sort of um, add additional funding in at this stage. But, uh, but no, we don't see any, any issues for the programme as a whole. Uh, and Tristan, if I could just come to you um, and just ask you that, I know you work for DFID, um, perhaps just your, your viewpoints um, on this. Um, yes, I mean, we, we have seen a 30% cut, um, and yet, yeah, no, it's completely, that is impacting our programmes. I mean, what we've done is an in sort of internal prioritisation process. So rather than getting rid of individual programmes, we've sort of looked at which programmes um, are most strategically aligned with what we're trying to achieve, and those programmes haven't had their budget cut. Other, other programmes have had budget cuts. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I mean obviously... I can't comment on all our sort of food security programs, but I mean, I don't know of any which have been cut. What they're likely to have seen is potential budget cuts um, with the hope that that would then be recuperated in later years within the program. Um, I hope that answers your question. That's great. Thanks, Tristan, for that. Um, I see a question here about the rec this being available as recording. Yes, it will be. It will go up onto our YouTube um, Sort of in the next few weeks so keep if you subscribe to our channel then you'll get notification of when that goes live um, i just had a question that i wanted to ask ed uh, if possible you talked a lot about um engaging with farmers and you, you mentioned a demonstration in, um, garden but i guess i just my question is is you know how popular was this demonstration garden and how important it, it is it do you think to engage with effectively the end users when you're trying to meet these ODA targets or requirements? Thanks, Tim. I think it's, it's hugely important and it's something that we uh, learned from. The, the nutrition garden that we, uh, that we showed in the, in the picture there, that was actually funded under another uh, UK uh, call about seven or eight years ago. And it was one of the most popular outputs from that project because it's something that seems to be wanting in this environment is a uh, as we call it a living classroom a, a walk-in farmer's school where you can see technologies demonstrated um, and ask questions of a, a technical assistant who's stationed there and even pick up samples and, and leaflets and information and that sort of thing so that was the sort of inspiration for us to first of all get out into the field as it were and talk to our intended beneficiaries in the case of this project smallholder farmers such that we could design our project um, around their needs um, at the current time because i can't stress enough the notion of believing that a, a, a consortium knows exactly what's needed in a, in a different context perhaps in an african country um, where they don't have so much experience 
and uh, the the misfit of, of that belief with reality on the ground. So talking to intended beneficiaries in whichever um, sector you're focusing on, I can't recommend more highly in order to guide your uh, your initial application and therefore its relevance, but further than that to um, promote uh, the achievement of your objectives over that two or three year project as it might be. Excellent. Thanks for that answer. That was, that was great. Um, I'll, we'll go back to some, we've got a few minutes left. Catherine, over to you, I think. Would you be able to clarify um, the role of NGOs and how that works with funding? Yes, um, so NGOs can take part in projects in early and mid stage and they can be partners, um, they can also lead. Um, there's a bit of um, the confusion on the competition briefing in terms of um, the wording not being that clear for NGOs, um, but we're updating that so it should be um, updated and it will be marked on there what's been changed so um, we can get that sent out as well. Thanks for that, Catherine. Um, coming back to Ed, if possible, Ed, just about, I guess, if it's a follow up question on, on the project. Um, Victor Olori is asking about the success of the Bean Wilt project in Kenya. Is there scope to scale it up or repeat the exact same project in other countries? Um, so I guess it's a, the sort of the future of the program, if you would care to comment on that. Ed. Sorry. Um, yes, thank you for the question, Victor. Um, it's, it's a great question. Of course, we couldn't repeat exactly the same project because what we were tackling or what we are currently tackling is um, a specific set of innovations. Um, and so we hope to achieve our objectives and therefore produce solutions to the challenges that we described in our initial application. So we wouldn't want to repeat the project necessarily, but we did um, talk in our application of the additionality of the research that we were proposing because you're right if it works in Kenya then it should work in, in Zambia for example or other countries that produce um, beans in this example in, in, in Africa. So there's scope for it but what would be uh, a natural progression would be another project, another application which builds on the findings and the success of the current project such that we're um, pushing the envelope and we're increasing the innovation in that particular space. So by all means, um, do let's get in touch and, and discuss that further um, offline. But yes, you, you can draw on successful applications to innovate in order to um, develop your own proposals that uh, draw on the, on the developments that innovate have clearly um, looked upon favorably before. That makes sense. That does. Thank you very much. Um, just a quick one, I think, from uh, from Tristan on the COVID question. So are you taking that into account uh, in areas like livestock and crop farming? Or perhaps Catherine wants to take this. I, either of you, I think, would be fine. Um, I can jump in. I mean, I think it's a great question and it's still something we're trying to understand. Um, so I mean, it's, it's still relatively new and we really want to you know, understand what is the interaction between COVID-19 and food systems and what are the areas we should be focusing on. I mean, there's, you know, there's various multi-donor task forces looking at this. We've got a number of programs looking at this. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's something we're very interested in. I think, um, yeah, I'll pass it over to Catherine about sort of more of the practicalities around um, working with partners and things in the Agritech Cast list. Thanks, Tristan. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think, um... As you say, I think yeah, DFID are looking at this um, in quite a lot of depth. Um, in terms of the practical side of Agritech Catalyst projects, um, we are sort of being more flexible in terms of projects and issues that they're facing because um, you know none of us really know um, knew what the, this was coming or what the impact it would have. Um, some projects have actually um, carried on pretty well as normal. Um, if people working on the project are living on the farm or very close to the farm, it can, um, it can be quite um, easy to carry on. Um, other work, you know, if you're working in labs or universities that have closed down or businesses that aren't open, then um, they're having some bigger impacts on the project. So we have had, um, we have allowed um, no cost extensions um, through a fast track process. We've allowed um, projects to switch to monthly payments 
So if you're having, um, if you're a business and you're having cash flow issues, and um, that can help sustain the project. So there's a number of different things we've done um, over the last few months to enable projects to carry on as they as well as they can during this period and trying to be as flexible as possible. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, I'd just like to uh, draw this session to a close. Thank you very much for attending. I hope it's been useful. Like I said, this will be available on our YouTube channel. If you subscribe, you'll get a notification when it goes live in the next few weeks. So once again, thanks to Catherine, to Tristan and to Ed and uh, goodbye.